Hi, today I'll be talking to you about polarity, electronegativity and van der Waals forces. In order to understand polarity of bonds and molecules, one must understand what electronegativity is first. So what is it? By definition, it is a measure of attraction of a bonded atom for the pair of electrons in a covalent bond. Now, if that sounded like a mouthful to you, hopefully this diagram can help you visualize what I'm trying to say. As you can see, the electron pair in the middle is being attracted by the atoms sharing this covalent bond. And this is precisely the attraction originating from these atoms that we're measuring when we're talking about electronegativity. Additionally, the greater the electronegativity of an atom, the closer the electron pair is to this atom, or if you want to be specific, this atom's nucleus. Here's another diagram for you to consider. You can see in this bond that A and B are representing different atoms. B is more electronegative, therefore the electron pair is closer to it. Now remember that the position of this electron pair is on average. Electrons aren't stationary, they're always moving, but typically they're closer to B because it's more electronegative. This raises the question, what makes an atom of an element more electronegative than the atoms of other elements? To answer this, there are three very familiar sounding factors that influence electronegativity. Firstly, proton number. Secondly, atomic radii. And lastly, shielding. Now, as the number of protons increase, um, the nuclear attractive force from the nucleus of an atom also increases which means electrons or electron pairs can be attracted to it relatively easily, which results in a stronger or a higher electronegativity of an atom. Now, atomic radii, as the distance from the nucleus of an atom increases, the nuclear attractive force felt on the outside of that atom decreases because it's further out. This decreases the electronegativity of an atom. And lastly, shielding. As electron shielding or screening increases because there are more electrons within uh, an atom, the nuclear attractive force decreases, which means the electronegativity of an atom decreases also. Now here's a periodic table of uh, elements to display this trend in electronegativity. As you can see on the top right, um, fluorine is the most electronegative with a value of 3.98, whereas francium is the least electronegative with a value of 0.7. These values are kind of based on hydrogen, which is always 2.2, so that you can kind of have a standardized scale to work out which atom is more electronegative than the other. But we don't really need to go into that much detail about that. Okay, now we are prepared to understand the relationship between electronegativity and bonding and polarity. But firstly, you must know what a covalent bond is. If you don't, please do revise it. Anyhow, to illustrate my point, I'll be using a covalent bond between two carbon atoms. On average, as you can see on the diagram, the electron pair is found in the middle, therefore are evenly distributed, which is obvious from the diagram itself. Now, linking to the concept of electronegativity, because uh, they're the same atoms sharing that covalent bond. There is no difference in electronegativity. Um, therefore, the bond is said to be nonpolar. Okay, to summarize, um, because there is no difference in electronegativities between the two carbon atoms, the attraction for the electron pair is equal, therefore, the bond is said to be nonpolar. By the way, you may have realized that my uh, diagram is, in fact, a highly rudimentary representation of the bond between two carbon atoms. If you uh, want to know really, it's actually a sigma orbital or a sigma bond. And in simple words, it's an overlap between two s orbitals linearly to make a single covalent bond. So in that respect, it's geometrically more complicated than uh, it's shown on the diagram. Anyway, back to polarity. Consider this diagram of hydrogen chloride. There is a difference in the electronegativities of hydrogen and chlorine. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, and we know why this is, as we discussed the reasons behind electronegativity already. 
as chlorine is more electronegative, it has a greater share of the electron pair in the bond on average. The unequilibrated distribution causes a slight charge difference between hydrogen and chlorine. This forms a permanent dipole. As you can see, hydrogen is delta positive because the electron pair is further away from it, whereas chlorine is delta negative because the electron pair is closer to it. This slight charge difference across the bond causes a polar bond to form between these two atoms. Therefore, this is a polar covalent bond overall, and the molecule itself is polar. Here's another diagram. Now, this is an odd-looking diagram. Uh, it's representing H2O. It's an electrostatic potential map of H2O. The oxygen is red because it has a more negative charge, whereas the hydrogen atoms are in blue because it has a more positive charge, and it's also a polar molecule. Moving on to this diagram here, which shows a scale that should hopefully allow you to see polar bonds in the context of other bonds. On the left side of the scale, we have ionic bonds in the middle, polar covalent bonds, and on the right side, non-polar covalent bonds. For the ionic bonds, uh, let's use sodium chloride as an example. Now, chlorine has fully captured the electron pairs as it's more electronegative than the sodium atom. It is said to be fully charged. If you want to be very specific, when two atoms form a bond and the difference in electronegativity is greater than 1.7 electron volts, uh, the bond is said to be ionic. So, uh, polar covalent bonds, uh, it's only said to be partially charged, and this is because dipoles have formed as opposed to, uh, let's use hydrogen chloride as an example. Chlorine hasn't fully captured the electron pair but rather it has a greater share of it compared to hydrogen. And again, if you want to be specific, uh, when the difference in electronegativity between two atoms is between 0.7 and 1.7 electron volts, the bond is said to be polar covalent bond. bond. Now, lastly, we have the non-polar covalent bond. Uh, because two atoms, and let's use the example of the uh, bond between two carbon atoms, the share of the electron pair is equal, therefore the uh, the overall uh, bond is said to be electronically symmetrical. If you want to be specific again, if the value in the difference in electronegativity between two atoms is uh, 0.4 or less electron volts, it is said to be nonpolar covalent. Finally, we have the polar molecule. For this, I'll be using the example of tetrachloromethane, or CCl4. As you can see, between each chlorine atom and the central carbon atom, a polar bond has been established. This is indicated by the uh, delta positive and ne delta negative symbols that indicate a permanent dipole formation. However, despite having a polar bond in between the atoms, the molecule itself is said to be nonpolar. This is because the dipoles are acting in different directions, which means the charges cancel out. Therefore, there is no overall dipole. Another way to look at this is that the molecule itself is symmetrical. Therefore, the charges are actually acting in different directions, like I said earlier. If this is still difficult for you to understand, Consider this, the chlorine atoms on the outer region are all negative, so the outer region of the molecule is wholly negative, whereas the central region, which is the carbon atom, is only positive. So it has that symmetry that I was talking about. Now have a look at this other diagram. This is of HCl3, or more commonly known, known as um, chloroform. This is in fact a polar molecule, and it looks overall different to tetrachloromethane, not just in the sense that the atoms actually differ because of the dipoles on the outer regions. For example, the hydrogen atom at the top is positive, whereas the chlorine atoms at the bottom show negative dipoles. This is the uh, electronegativity playing its part within the bonds. Because chlorine atoms are more electronegative compared to carbon atoms, uh, they have a greater share of the electron pairs in their bonds, whereas with the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom has 
less of a share of the electron pair, therefore it forms a positive dipole, whereas the carbon atom uh, forms a negative dipole. Overall, the molecule has a dipole. The top half is basically positive and the bottom half, we can say, is pretty much negative. Uh, in that sense, it's not symmetrical. Um, and linking to the idea of cancelling out dipoles, well, they don't really cancel out in this case. Another way to look at this, if you did not understand that, is that the dipoles aren't acting in different directions. What I mean when I say that is that, um, for example, the bond between carbon and hydrogen, the delta negative symbol is in the center, whereas the delta positive symbol is on the outer region. However, with bonds between carbon and chlorine atoms, the delta negative symbols are on the outer region, whereas the delta positive symbol is in the inner region. So in that sense, overall the molecule forms a dipole, and therefore the molecule is polar. And the last topic I'll be discussing will be the van der Waals forces. Now, if you've done your research, you may be thinking that the one we study is actually, in fact, called London Dispersion Forces, and van der Waals forces is actually an umbrella term for all intermolecular forces out there. Then you would be right, but just for the sake of relevancy, we'll call it van der Waals forces. If you're interested, you can look into Kizom or uh, Debye forces, but that's up to you to research. Anyhow, van der Waals forces exist between all types of molecules. Doesn't matter if they're polar or non-polar. There are weak intermolecular attractions between nearby molecules, and this attraction is due to temporary or induced dipoles. When I mentioned the word weak, uh, to give you an idea, van der Waals forces are a thousand times weaker than ionic or covalent bonds in terms of relative strength. Now to the origin of the van der Waals forces. Have a look at this diagram. Mobile electrons in shells disrupt the equilibrium of charges within. The electron density shifts from one side to the other as the electrons sh also shift from one side to the other. At any given moment, dipoles form along the molecule, which results in the induction of dipoles in other nearby molecules which does the same to other nearby molecules. So it's a sequence in that sense. It's pretty repetitive. These induced dipoles form weak attraction between molecules, which are called uh, van der Waals forces. Remember, this is not like the polar bonds we discussed earlier, where the dipoles are permanent. Here, the dipoles are induced, they're temporary. Now, if that was difficult for you to understand, uh, hopefully I can use this diagram to convey to you uh, what I'm trying to say. As you can see, the electrons are moving from one side to the other, and at any given moment, the electrons will end up on one side predominantly. This means that side will be slightly negatively charged, whereas the other side, without the electrons, will be slightly positively charged. The slightly negatively charged side, when it interacts with a new molecule, the electrons within the new molecule get uh, repelled away to the furthest side possible. This means that the uh, interacting side of the new molecule becomes slightly positively charged, which in turn becomes attracted to the slightly negatively charged side of the original molecule with the electrons in. This forms the van der Waals force, and this works in a sequence among uh, molecules, nearby molecules, it's also worth noting that the van der Waals force says increase with the number of electrons. As the number of electrons increase, the larger the induced dipoles are, and the attractive force between molecules also increase. This links to the boiling points of uh, molecules, and that's pretty much it for van der Waals forces, polar, non-polar bonds and molecules and electronegativity. Um, I obviously had more material on the topics, but they may just be too excessive and one has to be relevant to the level specification. Although I would definitely recommend that you should do further reading on these topics. Um, anyway, hopefully you've learned something new or have updated what you already knew. And if you didn't understand something, please rewatch the video. Um, I wish you all the best.